arrested Bay Yeager in connection with the abduction of an eight-year-old white female. She's widely known for running a network to save abused children. Now she's accused of kidnapping and cruelty. The only thing I tried to do was protect a few children, that's it. Is Faye Yeager a heroine, or is she, as the state maintains, a kidnapper who mentally abused children into falsely claiming their father had abused them? This will be a sensational trial expected to draw huge media attention. She knew where her child was at at all times. I deny all of her allegations. The charges are simple enough. One count of kidnapping, two counts of cruelty to children, and one count of interfering with the custody of a child. The sentences could add up to 61 years. They can't do anything else to me that would be any worse than what I've had to live through. is Bay Yeager, who's the founder of the Underground Network. She's now facing a jail term for kidnapping and being an abuser herself, which is impossible. Why were they... Oh, the police arrested you for this? Yes. Stuff. Yeah. And how long were you in jail? Um, about 15 hours. Oh, that... All right. Now, long why... enough to book me, fingerprint me, strip search me. Strip and search you? Yeah, they're the whole works. Mm -hmm. Well, I was arrested, supposedly, for kidnapping a child. Kidnapping a child? Yes. There was a young mom who asked Faye for help protecting her child. Faye then refused to give the child back when the mother changed her mind and said she didn't want the child to be in hiding anymore. Billy Faye Yeager charged with kidnapping, two counts of cruelty to children, and one count of interference with custody. It's a trumped up charge. I did not kidnap the child. The prosecution of Faye Yeager was a subterfuge, an excuse to execute a search warrant and find out as much as they could about her network. This is a setup. It's entirely a setup to get me, to shut me up. It was and is right and just and proper for Faye Yeager to have attempted to do what she attempted to do. You, I know, are doing such wonderful work. Yes, she is. You just just come luck. see me in jail. Oh, oh, don't even say that. Don't even say that. <laughs> May I call you next week? Faye Yeager. Jake, if you would come forward, please, madam, and stand at the witness station. No matter how brave she was and how strong a front she presented. She was scared. She was just terrified of getting convicted. <clears throat> Tell the ladies and gentlemen the jury your name, please. Billy Faye Yager. Do you know what your rights are? Yes, sir. What are your rights? <sighs> yeah. I, I know that, that I, do, I don't have to testify today. And if you testify, you know what can happen? Yes. What can happen? I, I know that if, if I, I could can tell something and end up con convicted. What's your desire with regard to those rights? I waive them. I, I, would, I want to tell the truth. The defense wanted this case to be presented to the jury as she was doing a, a, a public service. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury about what later became known as Children of the Underground. 
I have referred to children of the underground as being a, in some ways civil disobedience. There are times when there's no other alternative to keep a child safe, when vigilanteism is absolutely appropriate. When you received information about a, a particular child, what did you do with that information? Well, many times I would put the uh, information in a notebook type form. And I'd put the child's picture on the front. And I'd compiled medical records, psychological reports, police reports on the abuse, court records, and drawings. And tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why did you put that notebook together? When these children came, many times there would be documents that the prosecuting attorney didn't have and didn't know about. And, and what is contained within Defendants 106? It's, it's a notebook that I put together um, on my little girl. Michelle's drawings that she sent to me when she was five years old. Um, the court order in Florida where I only got two hours of my supervised visitation. Her gonorrhea report. And her notes, what happened to her. And her discharge from Charter Peach for the hospital. Is not admissible. That's always bothered me. But I, I, in these courtrooms where this evidence is presented, remember, most of the time it's not a criminal setting, it's family court. In family court cases, nobody knows what the standard of proof is when you have a case involving a child who is accused of father of sexual abuse. There's things that we know, and there's things that we can prove. And the court system only wants to know what you can prove. And so unless you have the rare case where someone was taking pictures of their illegal conduct, you generally speaking don't have evidence absent someone getting like, you know, a sexual disease at age six, right? That would be a red flag. But even with evidence like a sexual disease, it's not always enough. The experts come in and they talk about, well, it's possible that that child just had poor hygiene and they, they got it from a toilet seat, right? Or you miss a deadline to file the evidence and the judge deems it inadmissible. There are many factors that can get in the way, even with evidence that seems like it should be indisputable. It's subject to the whim of the court. Mothers who believe that their children were sexually abused lose custody much more often than mothers who didn't make the accusation. It's a big dilemma when I have protective parents coming to me wanting to say my child's being abused and I have to go, okay, well, let's think about this. If you make a claim of abuse without having proof of it, you could end up losing full custody and having only supervised visits and the abuser could end up having 100% custody legal and physical of the child that you're trying to protect. We may call you next week. Michelle Jones. Michelle Jones, please. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury your name? Michelle Jones. How old are you, please? 22. Do you know Faye Yeager? She's my mother. That's mom. She was beautiful. Like, this is the mom she was destined to be, and then it was taken from her. I mean, that's when I see this picture. I see the beginning of this really 
difficult path that she had to go on. This is a great picture of mom with me. That was before everything just went south. So there was still innocence there. There's still joy. From this point after, she never had a chance to do that again. Like, those moments were stolen from her. We have Roger. I mean, he just looks like a pedophile. That was right in the midst of when all that chaos was going on. After my father got custody of me, I would see my mom maybe twice a year. I didn't know she wanted me. I had no idea. You know, I was living under his control and being told daily that she didn't want me. So I felt like I was on an island unto myself. And, and I thought, I've talked, I've talked, I've told everybody, I've told everybody. Why bother saying it? Why bother saying you were abused and what happened during that abuse when it doesn't do anything? It does nothing. So I stopped talking about it. Who is your father? Roger Jones. And what were the charges against uh, your father? Um, pornography and child molestation. Was this as it relates to you? No, there are some other kids that he got a hold of. Roger had been charged with molesting not one, but several young girls. So I was like, okay, good. Now it's starting to kind of unravel for him. And I wanted my chance to say my side of what he did. When you came to see your mother, did you and she discuss all that had happened to you? Once the news was already out what he had done, I knew it was all right to tell somebody. And I called up my mother and I just told her the truth. I looked at mom and I went, you were right. And she goes, right about what? And I was like, all those times that you asked me about the abuse, I lied to you. You were right. He did abuse me. He read me a bedtime story while he, um, he didn't have intercourse, but he fondled me. And and did what you can think about. And just kept going. He'd bribe me with candy or with something to get me to do something for him sexually. How old were you? Seven or eight. I always felt uncomfortable until I hit the age of 12. And then when I realized that it was wrong, I stopped it. When I was 13, I stuck again to my father's head. I told him it was going to end and I was not born to be his wife. And did you keep a gun or a knife with you? Oh, yeah. I didn't protect her. I didn't run with her. I didn't go back down there and do what, what a child thinks you're supposed to do. A child thinks that you're there to protect them. Telling her didn't change the past, but she finally had a moment of vindication. Like, this really did happen. And that's the moment she started the children in the underground. I don't know how any of you people would feel if that was your kid. But I can just tell you that Faye Yeager was ready to to fight war when that happened. One day I picked up a newspaper and I read about a woman named Karen Newsom. She refused to turn her children over because they had been molested, but the judge didn't believe it. I'm 
was so outraged that I got myself on an airplane to Mississippi. I go down there and I start, start meeting with all these characters that are involved in the hiding of these two children. Not too long ago, I started looking at old tapes. This is the two children here when they first came. I had a call, like in the afternoon, that these children had to be put in hiding. It was the right thing to do. You know, I really didn't think twice about it. I had been through it myself. It happens. I knew what the mother was going through. I knew what the system was doing. And Faye called me up and said, I'd like to come over and help. I said, sure, we need all the help. We really do, you know. And then I met my friend Sarah. Sarah got involved from Charleston. We were all so naive in the beginning. I was a flight attendant. I married a pilot. He was tall, good looking. I thought he was just an amazing person. And he was, except for this one little problem he had, that he liked children too much. I used to think I was the only person. But I learned that the magnitude of the problem was much bigger than I ever thought. We started meeting with all of these involved women. And we decided we needed to form a group and give it a name. And we came up with the name Mark, which was Mothers Against Raping Children. Mark was the beginning of a collective fight, not just for our children, but for anyone else who was in that same position. If we had met under any other circumstances, I'm not sure we would have become friends. As it was, we became sisters because we became so entrenched in trying to change the system. I'm perfectly willing to break the law and hide any child that I feel is being abused by the legal system. We decided to make Faye our spokesperson. Can you give me your name? Faye Yager. And that's Y-A-G-E-R. Yes, sir. She could charm any reporter or oh, charm yeah. any... They loved her. And she started out very quiet and humble. But once she became on the news every day and on the front of magazines, it became... Well, the story kept growing and growing yeah, and growing. Yeah, all of a and sudden, we'd help 10,000 kids, and that's not true. <laughs> I've got over 2,000 files, 2,500, 3,000 families at least. But it really helped getting the word out. Question? Yes, Mrs. Yeager, I'm curious. How do you finance your program? Mostly it's financed by people that get involved, uh, people such as yourself. She needed to reach out to the people, the good people who are going to help protect these mothers. If you're a man or a woman who has questions with Faye Yeager, you can reach her at Children of the Underground. The word did get out. I'm telling you, the only way I can stop is for you people to get out there and do something about it. When they heard what we were doing, people came forward to get involved in it. I must have gotten 1,300 letters or more. And it started growing. Now, how did you get involved in sheltering fugitives? You look like such upstanding folks. <laughs> we are. We looked at each other, and we said, if this is going on in America, then we can't stand by and do nothing. And we got a lot of high-profile support. One day, this lady came up and stood in front of me for a minute, and then she asked if she could sit down next to me. I said, I'd be honored. It was Gloria Steinem. I had a great deal of respect and admiration for the courage and the creativity of protective mothers, in this case, who were in that situation. I remember saying, look, I have an apartment. You can, you know, you can, I can be a stop on the Underground Railway. It was just amazing how many people were sympathetic. I mean, you've got community approval. It really helped. On our telephone poll, the vote is 98% yes for the Underground Railroad and 2% no. That's a rather healthy example. Mom! Hi. Hi. 
Hi. Just checking in on mom. There's my beautiful mama. And me and my brother. I think this was probably after the divorce, that picture. So this picture is special to me because it's before we left. It was my first communion. So I was eight years old. So I always get a little emotional when I look at these communion pictures. It's kind of the, I mean, life was already crazy by then, but it was kind of like before life went to the next level of crazy, so. Mom and dad decided to get divorced. The custody battle, it, it went on for a very long time, over years. When my mom thought that my dad was abusing us, she didn't want to risk us going there or him maybe having full custody of us. So that's when she d devised the whole plan, her and my stepdad, to take us and go on the run. My mom told us that we were going to Disney World and she kept saying, pack all your favorite toys. Make sure you bring all your favorite clothes, all your favorite toys, bring all your favorite things. And I was like, okay, like why am I bringing my favorite toys to Disney World? We're going to Disney World. And I had no idea. And that was it, we were gone. Just like that. So we had a little travel trailer that we pulled across the country. And I think some ladies in Oregon said to my mom, get in touch with Faye Yeager. She's the one that can help you. This is Faye Yeager's house. Spent a lot of time here. Her basement was full of legal boxes with videos of kids she had interviewed and documents. And it, this was like her command center. I do remember being interviewed by Faye on tape. I remember her being very, like, you know, her mean voice. It was just me in a room with her. It was very intimidating. Your Honor, at this time, the uh, state seek to tender into evidence the tapes that were seized at Ms. Yeager's house as to show modus operandi. The prosecution was introducing tapes that they thought showed Faye in a bad light and met the statutory criteria for the crime of cruelty to children. Faye Yeager, the judge, and all the lawyers moved their seats around closer to the jury box so they could watch the first of six videotapes seized from Faye Yeager's home. You will see how the children were intimidated and scared and frightened and threatened. If you decide she was cruel to those children, the prosecution said, you can decide she was cruel to the children in this case. Uh, you will see the tape. This is Faye Yeager with Children of the Underground. Well, let's just talk about what your daddy did to you, okay? Okay, I need you to speak up. Okay. Ms. Yeager, why do you use the type of interviewing that you use with the children? I began to see children that, that uh, didn't, didn't just, wouldn't just come out and tell you what was happening to them. But you agree that your approach is aggressive. Yes, ma'am, I would agree it was aggressive in some ways. They was not competent, trained to conduct a, a forensic interview. Faye's techniques were exactly what we would train people how not to interview a child. Will you please state as to the observations that you had made as far as viewing those particular tapes? The technique of interviewing, which is quite different from what one generally uses as a professional in terms of being a child psychiatrist. Do you remember me? It's her. 
At times, Ms. Yeager herself is very supportive, dries tears, hugs children, and so on. At other times, I would characterize the uh, interviewing technique as rather aggressive. You were right. By who? She accuses the children of lying. You've been lying to me. But I couldn't remember that then. The technique used uh, reminds one of the police in terror police in the movies, interrogating witnesses. Are you playing stupid with me today? No. No? You know what I'm talking about, though, don't you? If we're going to seek the truth, we need qualified forensic interviews in an environment that is conducive for children to tell the truth. Today, it's just common sense. But back then, we didn't know better. Has that ever happened to you anything like that? Yeah. At this moment in American legal history, there's no real precedent for interviewing kids like this. Let me ask you a question. Do you like the love package? Yes. Oh. We weren't clear on how to do this, how long you should interview kids for, what happens when you ask kids questions. I consider the 1980s to be an era where the people that are trying to address the sexual abuse of children are pioneers. Pioneers are trying to do something that hasn't been done. There are plenty of mistakes in these earlier cases. See, that's like a daddy dog. But what are you supposed to not interview? There were children being abused, and something did need to be done about it. I just want to document everything she said, you know, as far as what happened to her, so that I could send the tapes to the authorities. Faye Yeager brought them tapes so that she could share with law enforcement the problem that exists in this society and get them to act. Because the prosecution opened the door to the tapes, it gave Faye the opportunity to show how many different children, you know, had been horribly abused. I don't want to. Because if I go back to So I think the question became, why is Faye on trial? and none of these rapists ever went to trial. Isn't it accurate that your past tragedies have been the motivation for your way you go about interviewing and the purpose of the underground? I would, I would think so, Miss Wing. I would always tell Michelle that if there was anything going on that she should tell me, that I would do everything I could to help her. She would cry, and then she would get angry with me and mad at me for, for asking. Then I, I wouldn't push it. And, and I would think that maybe I was, maybe it really wasn't happening. I'm not getting any questions, Sean. you make that man. Jaeger testified today she never meant to hurt these children. She's offended her tough questioning technique as necessary to get the truth. Faye's passion springs from her experience with her own daughter. When Roger was charged with molesting young girls in Florida, he told me he was going to try to prove his innocence, and I'm like looking at him going, you're as guilty as hell, <laughs> because I do not realize who you're talking to. Like, <laughs> kind of know you. And then when the court date came up, he didn't show up for court, and he went on the run. When he went on the run, he needed money. He had a used car lot, was probably 100 cars. He called me and said, I need you to sell these. And I was like, no. I was like, he's a rapist, he's a pedophile, and he deserves to have nothing. And I start just liquidating, trading them for horses. The horses were what I loved the most. They were some kind of outlet of normalcy and of peace during that period of chaos. Next thing you know, I got all these, I got like six horses. He calls like a month or so later and is like, hey, really need to get that money from you selling. I'm going to need it for the run. And I was like, yeah, about that. I was like, I spent it all. <laughs> he came unglued. And I just went, click. 
hung up on him. Find out. The people I sold the cars and stuff to found five to ten tapes in this trunk of this convertible Cadillac. Well, back then, what do you do? You stick them in the VCR, you know what I mean? You see what's on them. You videotapes these interactions with these children, and they're like, oh my gosh, they call the police, the police come in, they seize all the tapes. And that's when he ended up as the first pedophile to be on the 10 most wanted list. He turned out to be one of the most notorious child molesters this country has ever seen. We want Roger Jones for rape on young children. There is no indication that he will stop. Look at this headline, lock up your kids if you spot this man. And they turned your daughter back over to this man. Yeah, my child had a venereal disease and they were treating her for it and they handed her to him. After all of that, he was caught in the act and they arrested him. He skipped bond and he's been at large for two years and the FBI, they don't spend their time trying to find him. Instead, they spend their money trying to catch me in the act of having one of these abused children. He was on the run for three or four years. And I was sitting there eating a bowl of cereal, <laughs> watching the morning news and headline. Ten most wanted caught. Is there punishment enough for what he's done in your mind? No. No. Um, I used to say that I wished he was dead. And uh, Michelle says, Mommy, you, you don't want that. She said the worst thing that could happen to him, the thing that frightens him the most, is that he would have to stay in jail. Mom and I went down to Florida for the trial. When I testified against my father, I looked straight through him like he was nothing. Because at that point, he was nothing. But it was never charged with what he did to me. You literally almost have to have a red flag waving with video footage and all this other stuff. And it's like, are you fucking kidding me? The system is not going to save you. Harriet Newman Cohen, you are an attorney. Yes. You do do these kinds of cases, and you believe even if the courts fail that you should not kidnap your child and take your child underground. We've got laws in the United States that are set up in order to protect the Why children. Why don't you just open your eyes for a minute and look at what's going around around you? Oh, I People, no, wait a minute. People like you are the reason why they lose their kids, why I had them go through hell for 17 years, my excuse me, my life, because someone like you doesn't want to believe what's going on and no, wants no, no, to I abide don't. by the rules. My mother abided by the rules and got thrown into a crazy home, had shock treatments done, and everything else got humiliated by everyone and his brother because someone wanted to abide by the rules. There's one half. Mandy and I were underground living in Georgia for almost two months. We stayed with Faye for a little bit. But I realized that it was better not to stay in one spot too long because people start asking questions. And Faye knew what to do. A decision is made on, on where they might go permanently. And they're taught how to get new ID, how to acquire it, how to build up a new identification. And once they establish new ID, they move to start a new life. It takes about six months to a year. How would they go about doing the false identification? To be honest, we never got to the bottom of that. and We never fully were able to uh, identify that. In the early stages of the underground, I tried to help her mom as much as I could. I had a lot of connections down in Florida with, you know, more elaborate fake IDs. I just shared with mom on how to execute so then they could roll underground. Babe, 
they would go to cemeteries and find gravestones that fit the age of the child that we needed to protect. It's baby land. That's where babies are buried. Walk through a graveyard, find somebody around your time frame that had just passed, pull a birth certificate. We're looking for someone who died at a young age who didn't have any kind of history or anything, you know. So she'd have a new birth certificate. A birth certificate. So she'd have a new name. From the birth certificate, you can get a social security number. Then we get a passport. It worked. It, it so worked. I mean, how many times I would go to the social security office to get social security cards and stuff. It just worked. <laughs> Here's my um, the birth certificate. This is the birth certificate that I got. I'm Karen Ann DeVree. I was born in New Jersey, by the way. Do you know where that is? Um, How do you say it? Passaic. <laughs> Passaic. Oh, look, then you were Mandy Mae DeVree. After I took the identity of Karen Ann DeVree, I got married. We decided that we were going to settle down. The family that offered a safe house for us to stay at had moved from New Jersey to um, Watkins Glen. And they were like, come to Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen's in New York, bottom of one of the Finger Lakes. I found out that I was pregnant with Rob and Joe. Nothing like being underground and getting pregnant. But we met this lovely couple, Sandy and Dick Jones. They had this little house right next to their house that they would rent. Well, we came in and sat down in the living room at this big old farmhouse. And um, Karen Ann was talking. Do you still call her Karen Ann? Yes. Most of the time, Karen Ann is the only name that I've ever known her by. I know her real name is April, but. <laughs> oh, you got a wiggle worm in your arms. Oh, wiggle girl. And after I had Rob and Joe, you know, and it's, it's very difficult having a newborn and a five-year-old. Any mom would tell you that. But I'll never forget Sandy walking over one day. He's like, where is your mother? <laughs> and I just like, just broke down, you know, in tears and like the whole story came out. And she offered total protectiveness. Oh, absolutely. I wanted to do anything I could do to help them after I learned. And then you harbor fugitives. Yeah. I <laughs> never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right, harboring a fugitive. <laughs> what a pretty family. Ooh, look at the pretty ribbon. Mandy has said that her best childhood memories were when we were living in Watkins Glen. Wave hi. Hi. But, you know, Mandy had this extreme anxiety all the time. I had to make sure I was back at the house every afternoon when the bus was going to drop her off. Because if I wasn't, she would freak thinking that the FBI had found me. I mean, that was always in the back of our minds. Here we go. My name is Charlotte Cristoni. I'm a private investigator. I always wanted to help children because I was a victim of sexual abuse at a very early age. And in those days, most families kept it a secret. When I started hearing stories about a woman named Faye Yeager, I was saying, thank God, that, that's wonderful. She knew that I had worked with a group called Massa Mothers Against Sexual Abuse and that 
I encouraged mothers to get as far away from the abuser as possible. Faye told me she would really like me to come to her home sometime. There was at least a half dozen women inside her house. I said, you're literally hiding in plain sight. What keeps the police department from coming down on you? The feds are something. She goes, oh. I got the blessings of not only attorneys, but law enforcement. I thought, hmm, I gotta be kind of careful around this girl. <laughs> She's playing with the big boys. Mm. I was shocked. I met Faye Yeager in the 80s. I heard about her first and about the children of the underground. When judges ordered children back with the abuser, moms would ask me, well, what would you do, Mr. Morgan, if it was your child? And I said, I would do anything and everything to protect my child, and there are resources for you to do so. And did you ever contact Faye and tell her about a family? No, I did not contact Faye because I would have been an accomplice. I would let the mother know that there were potential resources, but that I could not be a part of her contacting those resources. I believe much of the system was conflicted by the underground that was hiding children. So one part of them knew that there were legitimate cases where children weren't being protected and they knew there had to be a safety valve. Many, many people are involved, people you wouldn't believe. People that are going on the run are being told by prosecuting attorneys, by their lawyers, by family and children's services, uh, by judges in some cases to do this. John Raymond, who was the director or assistant director of Missing and Exploited Children, when I explained what we were doing, he said, if you know of a case and it's a serious situation, you call me, tell me who, and we won't put them on milk cartons. I adored him for that. There was a lawyer that I worked with. She was in with the FBI. And she knew when they were watching us. She knew when we were going to have a arrest warrant. She let us know because they believed in what we were doing. One of the people that Faye said she had in her pocket was the deputy, deputy police chief of Fulton County. And his name was Red Mulliford. She claimed that if he knew any warrants, he would let her know ahead of time. Thing enjoyed the adventure, the excitement, the unpredictability. Are you your now? The FBI. Why? Because he called me. The attorney's call. Find out what he's doing. Who he's snooping after today. It was almost like a dance. We just sort of laugh it off and say, oh, Faye. But it, it, towards the end, it got really bad. All across this country, mothers and children are on the run. They're living in shelter. The Geraldo Show was the first day of the next five years of my life that put me through hell. That was the Geraldo Show. Who are you, ma'am? I'm Lydia Rayner. It's funny, because they put me on one side, and they put Faye on the other side. Amanda. And then Geraldo wanted to have a family on there, you know, that we had in hiding at the time. Is your daddy a good man, or do you think he's a bad man? He's a bad man. In all of these shows, they always, you know, have the wronged father um, who wants to come on. Joining us right now, Dr. Larry Spiegel. He's a psychologist, a father wrongfully accused of sex abuse. He's the author. Larry Spiegel was an advocate for um, fathers that had been unjustly charged with abusing their children. He detailed his traumatizing experience, the experience of the falsely alleged child abuse. He has He's been himself. accused of sexual abuse his daughter, and he was acquitted, but most of the fathers were acquitted. And Geraldo was trying to stir everybody up. We all heard what that sweet little thing said her father did to her. Yes. Should she be believed? She should not be believed on the basis of that statement. I have yet. To hear well, a three and a half over, year old. When you have psychologist reports, doctors reports. Let me just finish what I'm going to say, okay? You know, same, just hang on for one moment. Listening to him, I was just crazy mad. And then Faye stood up. I'd like to address my question to Dr. Spiegel. Isn't it true that you, as part of your practice, um, sexually assault your patients? And currently, you're being sued by two of your patients for malpractice suits for sexually assaulting young girls? 
No, that's not true, Faye. Well, you well, know well, that. Introduce yourself now. I'm sorry, yeah, I can What go. I would like to know is why this woman, she's playing judge, jury, by herself, taking the law into her own hands and affecting the, the lives of innocent children, is permitted to just do this and get away with it. Do what? Do what? Protect children? The court system certainly Take isn't protecting children. the place of the system that's designed to help and to intervene. But he took Faye off, and that's when she stood up and started screaming. Did you forget about my child? My child was taken from me when she was three years old and given to a child molester. She had just had enough of him, you know, had enough of him, what he was saying. You are lying. You raped your child, and you know you did. Oh, well, I don't <laughs> um, You're a rapist, you rapist, you rape your child, you know you raped your child. And that was it. We were sued for $5 million. You know, it was, it was what Faye said, but we all got sued. You just can't say what you want to say or do what you want to do, whether you think it's right or wrong. Faye got us in trouble. Always. I love you, Faye, but for God's sake, shut up. <laughs> you know, we kept telling her, you got to tone it down. You have to, like, we can't say these things. And she just, it just, it got worse. It just got worse. Too much, way too much. She was doing things in Atlanta. We were doing things, and a lot of time we couldn't keep up with what she was doing. She wouldn't know? tell us. I was adamant that we had to know it was a real case. My fear was mess up one time and your credibility's gone. But they stopped doing some things the way it needed to be done. And as far as helping moving families, it took about three months before we said we could do it. We would verify the court records, and we had social workers verify all the medical records. And then after we all got together at our MARC meetings and, and we talked, talked about it before we would and decide what we're going to do, then we decided we will take this case. And she said she's going to call here. Okay. For Faye, it was just real quick, you know, as soon as you got the call, let's put him in hiding, you know, hit the, you know, get on the bus or whatever you're going to do. I'll be there, you know, wear the color red, put a daisy in your hat. I don't know what she would say. She was able to create a perception that if you didn't go on the run, that uh, you were harming your child, that it would be immoral not to go on the run. There were people that she was helping that didn't have the evidence that this is real, that these children are at risk. That stopped being part of her M.O., and we couldn't afford it. When you hear a story, how do you know if they're telling the truth? If you've ever been in that situation, I mean, you can look them in the eye, and you not. That put us all in jeopardy. And just couldn't carry on what we were doing like that. And she wasn't going to change. Faye was Faye, you know. We wrote a letter and said we're sorry, but we can't be associate with you anymore. Please don't use the mark name. The more I found out about Bay Yaker, I got very concerned. A father contacted me and said that he had two boys that he knew were being uh, abused by their mother and the group of people the mother was associating with. The father went into great detail about how he had found the perfect person to help the children. She is an expert in this. And I even have a video of when she was interviewing my boys. I said, you do? Joshua? Is that your name, Joshua? Mm -hmm. You scared, Joshua? Scared of me? Mm -hmm. You gonna tell the truth today? Are you real scared to tell the truth? <laughs> Don't get all upset. Don't get all upset. Listen to me. Just listen to me, okay? There's nothing to be scared of here. You want your cross? Does that make you safe? There comes a point in time you see a piece of paper and a pen scratching 
out a crucifix. It's in your pocket. You'll be safe, okay? <laughs> These evil things are talking to you, it won't hurt you anymore, right? right? Somebody telling you not to talk? I said, wait a minute. What's going on here? What kind of meeting did you go to with? Gavel meeting. Gavel meeting? What did they do with the gavel meeting? Shot people, kicked and killed. And what'd they do? They prayed to the devil. Faye Yeager has a dark theory about child abuse. Do any of you have any knowledge of the concept of the worship of Satan? She claims that much of the child abuse reported in the United States can be blamed on satanic cults. Exhibit 83 has some clear uh, satanic symbols. I had to drink their blood. All of these children have been subjected to some form of abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, ritualistic, satanic. Uh, I don't think that's in question. Your daddy believes in what? The devil. What does he do that makes you think he believes in the devil besides hurt people? Tell people. Hold on to the Bible. Okay? Hold on to it. 